The first panel includes Denny Housley, Assistive Technology Acquisition Manager, Tools for Life, Artie Segal, founder of Synergy's Work, Zach Bradley, peer support uh, counselor right here at the Shepherd Center, and Barry Whaley, deputy Southeast ADA Center, Burton Blatt uh, Institute. Good morning. I am Danny Housley. So I'm going to talk about the Credit Able program um, and some of the work that we do at Tools for Life and with the uh, Center for Financial Independence and Innovation. Um, I am the, as I said, the Assistive Technology Acquisition Manager at Tools for Life. So I work with um, people to find uh, funding resources to acquire the technologies that they need to be more independent. Um, I run the Credit Able Loan Program. I'm always looking for grants. I often joke that I cry a lot at night um, <laughs> trying to find those grants for individuals. A little bit about us. There's an image up here that is me <laughs> with a uh, head-based video magnifier on. Um, so we have two big parts to our mission at Tools for Life. Um, the first is um, uh, access to assistive technology. Uh, we handle that through our um, lending library of equipment. So we have a number of items throughout the state so that people can actually get some hands-on experience. We can do some demonstrations with them on different devices. Um, it's education about what devices are out there um, because people often just don't know <laughs> what the options are. Uh, we work with people to identify the barriers that they're facing and then the finding the tools to, uh, to break those barriers down. The second part of our mission is acquisition of assistive technology, and that's where I spend a lot of my time, um, is looking at how do we get those things? How do we afford it? What are the options that are out there? Um, instead of buying something new, are there reused options? Um, we're really big about reuse and reutilization of assistive technology at Tools for Life. So um, sometimes finding that used option, finding that reused option is um, a really good fit for an individual, especially if you know, they're on a limited income or uh, that item isn't going to be covered by insurance or Medicaid, Medicare. Um, so we have, uh, when we look at these tools, we look at the four big areas of life. We want to make sure that people have the tools they need to live, learn, work, and play in the community of their choice. Um, so at the heart of it, it is that individual that determines what it is that they want to use. Um, to be more independent. And we want to make sure that all those areas are hit. Um, it's important to be able to, to get up, get dressed, and go to work. What do you do for fun? <laughs> what are those recreation items? Um, that's just as important as anything else. You want to have a nice, well-rounded um, life. So looking at that um, is vital. Um, so the Center for Financial Independence and Innovation works very closely with Tools for Life. Uh, the Credit Able program is a true collaboration between our two organizations. Um, this is our nonprofit partner, and um, their main mission is looking at um, financial inclusion, financial independence for people with disabilities in the state of Georgia. Uh, the Center for Financial Independence and Innovation is a certified um, Community Development Financial Institution, or CDFI. Um, so we are certified for the whole state. <laughs> so some CDFI service, you know, they serve a city, they serve a county. We serve all of Georgia. Um, the same thing with Tools for Life. Uh, Tools for Life is a statewide organization. So we, we serve all ages, all disabilities, and all parts of Georgia. Um, so we're on the go a lot. We're traveling to the, the far reaches of Georgia, to the rural locations where we're needed um, the most, <laughs> I think, with, uh, with some of our places. All right. So um, a little bit about Credit Able. Um, so this is a loan program for people with disabilities, or um, a family member or guardian can take out this loan, or an employer um, can take out the loan. And we have worked with the whole wide spectrum of that uh, for people that have come into the program. So uh, we have had a, a small business that has taken out a loan for um, one of their employees. Uh, they wanted to make sure that this individual had the accommodations to continue working and co to continue being productive. So uh, we were able to work with them to, to get that done. We've worked with people that are caregivers um, that need that home modification or that need a vehicle modification to make sure that the, the person that they're providing services for can get out and get into the community. Um, but the, a bulk of our people come directly, <laughs> so we do a lot of uh, direct lending to people. Um, so the assistive technology loan is 
um, specifically for assistive technology. So we use the definition of AT that comes from the federal legislation from the AT Act. Um, I will not give you the clearest concrete definition, but what it boils down to is that anything that increases your independence is assistive technology. So that could mean a computer, software. It could be a ramp being added onto your home. Uh, one of the, my favorite examples that I give is a front-loading washer and dryer. That's assistive technology. Uh, we worked with a person who, um, he was using attendant care to do his laundry, but he's like, look, I can do my own laundry. I just need to be able to, to pull it out of the front. I can't reach in to, to unload it. And we're like, fantastic. Well, let's go for it. <laughs> so uh, we were able to grant him the loan. And now that's, you know, laundry takes some time. So that's two to three hours a week that he can use that attendant for other things. Um, so he's maximizing his resources both financially, but also the resource that he's using as far as personal care attendance and, and services. So that's, that's important. Um, our AT loan, we can do a maximum of $10,000 at a 3 to 8% interest rate. So um, we try to keep their interest rates low um, because we're not trying to gouge <laughs> the disability community, but we're also trying to ensure that there's some sustainability with the program as people are paying it back. Anything we get back goes right back out um, into the community in the form of another loan. And then we can do a maximum of eight years for the term, so we try to be flexible uh, with the individuals. Now, it's a maximum of eight, <laughs> but we also look at the life of the device because we don't want, um, you know, we don't want somebody to take a loan out for five years for a computer and then it dies two years in. We don't want that. <laughs> so there's that educational piece again that goes with it when we're like, all right, let's look at what are the features you need, what can you afford, how do we set that price? So um, we do work with individuals to, to check with that. We also have the First Step program. Uh, First Step was a program that I started last year, uh, right around this time, actually. <laughs> and it is our credit builder program. So um, again, it's a small loan. Um, so with it, we can do a maximum of $1,000. It can be used for um, whatever the individual needs. So uh, some people have used it to get out of uh, predatory lending. They've gone to a payday lender. They've gotten stuck. Um, so we want them to get out of that situation. <laughs> so we can help with getting them out of that, and then they're repaying the Credit Able program at a much lower percent interest uh, rate. So 4% is what our credit builder programs are capped at. That is that is the set rate <laughs> for that program. Um, now this is meant for people that have a credit score of zero or a credit score that's been damaged over time. One of the things with our program is that when somebody applies, you know, we pull their credit report. Anything that's medical, we just strike through. Nothing, none of that is going to count against the individual. Um, and so we're really just going to look at what is the meat <laughs> of the, uh, the credit uh, report outside of anything medical. Um, so again, if you have zero or if you've acquired a disability, um, sometimes if you acquire a spinal cord injury or if you suddenly lose your vision, then there's a whole adjustment period that you go through. Um, during that transitional period, sometimes leases get broken, bills fall behind, things happen, and we understand that. So we, uh, we really do work closely with the individual to get that story behind just those numbers and just those things that are reported. Um, because if we look and we're like, all right, well, I see a lot of stuff happened around 2015. What was going on then? <laughs> so oftentimes what you'll see is you can tell if it's an acquired disability, you can kind of tell when things happened, when things went sideways, and then we work together to get back on track. Um, it's a very personal program. I always tell people, I'm like, it's personal because you only get to work with me. <laughs> if you call, I'm the one that answers the phone, or I'm the voice that you hear with the voicemail, you're going to get me um, whether you like it or not. <laughs> so, but people generally do tend to like it, fortunately. Okay, I've had no complaints. <laughs> All right. Um, and so that's the, the bulk of what I had. I just wanted to throw out the, the program, what we do. I'm happy to answer questions when we get to the Q&A part. Uh, but I do have two links on here. One is um, for the Center for Financial Independence and Innovation, CFIIGA.org. And then the other is for Tools for Life, and that's uh, GATFL.org. Um, so on there, we have a, a wealth of resources. We have some of our financial education um, resources, as well as um, items for assistive technology and finding, finding the right tool. So that is my part, thank you. My name is Arti Segel. 
and I run a nonprofit called Synergy's Work. It's a simply uh, incubator, helping people with disabilities set up their own businesses. Um, a small brief introduction is in the brochure, and I was reading it today morning, and I realized like reading that is like reading an introduction to a tiger mom, a typical Asian tiger mom. <laughs> and, and I have no qualms in admitting that I'm one of those moms who has those long IEP meetings for her son, who is always a contrarian. And I remember um, when my son was in fifth grade, uh, they planned to take him uh, to Walmart and he has a disability. So in fifth grade, they were trying to take him for, to Walmart and I was the one like, no, 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 no. I went to the administrator and said, I want my son to go to a bank. And of course, I lost that battle and I kept my son away from school that day. But for the longest of the times, I have been fighting for financial inclusion, including people with disabilities in this conversation. I believe that it's a very important tool as Michael mentioned earlier today, um, the largest percentage of population, working age adults are living in poverty are the people with disabilities. And that's the largest minority group, larger than the Hispanic population or the black population, or women-led households in the country. And uh, it's a tool that fights poverty because if you have the money, you can save. You can save for emergencies, you can invest for higher education, buy a house, or invest in a business. So needless to say that we cannot talk about education, we cannot talk about employment if we do not talk about financial inclusion. And that's what I'm gonna to cover today is how we are addressing this in our scope of work that we are doing. So our vision is simple. We help people to become financially empowered by helping them set up their own business ventures. We are hoping that we are able to build a community of mentors, professionals, business owners, with and without disabilities, who can be a resource to other people who want to set up their own businesses. And our philosophy is on a simple premise that everybody has a gift. I have a friend, Mike Green, who talks about that everybody, everybody, needless to say whether they have a disability or not, has a gift to offer. And they have a gift of hands, heart, or head. So we need to find out what their gift is and find out how we can change that gift into something that they can earn money from. And this is what we call earth. Uh, it's a Sanskrit word. In Japanese, it's called igikai. Um, and it is not a special ownership of people with disabilities. There's nothing special to it. If you are one of those people who gets up in the morning and says, yeah, I want to go to work. This is the best day. And excited about their work, you found your true passion. You are operating in that beautiful zone of called Ikigai. And that's what we try to do in our business. The center picture is of one of the people that I work with. He's an artist. Um, and he's fond of all kinds of art, theater, uh, impressionists, uh, visual arts, uh, animation. And when he was six years old, his work was selected by the North Georgia chapter of autism to represent their uh, uh, sector. And I've got, the, my, I was reading yesterday National Geographic and I have that book with me here because they were talking about, they've covered a Picasso. And when he was nine years old, he, his work was recognized for the first time or whatever. And I was thinking like, ah, oh, the people that I work with are no less talented than Picasso. Uh, so there he is. Uh, we are trying to help him set up his own business. He does furniture paintings, he does maps, and um, extremely talented person. The other gentleman in the center is Peter Ahn. Uh, he has been working and trans again an artist who has turned his art into gifts, mementos, uh, corporate uh, uh, items, and he has, in the last one and a half years, sold 5,000 different greeting cards made money. But more importantly, he is one of those guys uh, recognizing him beyond the label of autism in, as a person with uh, talent, as an artist, has changed his life. He's not just making money, but he is now traveling across the world with his different swim team. He represents United States in swimming, 
and he travels alone. He attends conferences with me, sits on the panel of uh, young entrepreneurs uh, along with all other entrepreneurs. So it has really transformed his life. In fact, on your um, center of your table, you will see some of the greeting cards made by the artists from Synergy's work that we represent. And you're free to take these cards. Uh, and if anybody wants an extra card, please reach out to me. I have some with me and I'll be happy to give them to you. But it's not just artists that we work with. The gentleman at the top is John Craze, and he is trying to set up a coffee shop in Talonega. We helped him uh, develop his organizational structure for him. And then we have an artist, um, uh, sorry, a journalist who runs a radio station from Clarkson City. And he has um, lost his vision when he was 13 years old. And he runs a participatory, a very unique kind of a radio station out of Clarkson City. Our strategy is simple. A work from starting from the viable business and a financial plan and the help individuals set up their own in economic goals. These are not predetermined by the state or the government. It is what you want to make, how you want to make, how many hours you want to spend. So that's how you set up your business plan. We, work, we have worked uh, with a lot with the whip up the Shepherd Center, Sally Atwell sitting here, with the Georgia v, uh, GVRA's uh, Shanti Aron on work incentives planning. We have talked about ABLE accounts, and we'll hear more about it today. We have uh, done financial uh, literacy workshops, seminars with FDIC, um, Elaine Hunter, and uh, we reached out to organizations who are engaged in financial law education because we do believe it's an important and integral part of it. We are working with SBA uh, on business planning processes. Um, and more importantly, we are building sustainability. We are very proud to say that most of the people that we work with are not just with us for three months, but it has taken me two years and it'll probably take me longer till they are able to reach sustainability. We are not there turning out numbers. Through all our programs, we have touched almost 500 people, and there are some of them who are still continue to be in our, um, in our gamut, because that's what it is taking to build sustainability. So if it means setting up an online e-shop, that's what we have for uh, people who can sell their products on our e-gallery, and uh, they can decide when they want to work, how much they want to sell. It, we are partnering with corporations so that the collective bargaining power of the people that we represent is stronger, and the consumers are reaches bigger and higher to the consumers. We are talking to GCDD, Kate, uh, to talk about co-ops. Is there a possibility of building up co-ops? That's what sustainability would look for then. So I invite you, you know, there is, uh, since this uh, National Geographic article is in my mind, there is a sentence they talk about that geniuses require a lot of work from the parents and the educators. Uh, that is something that does not happen for people with disabilities because we label them so fast and so soon and that label is so powerful that we forget to look at their geniuses in them. So we are hoping from people from outside the disability world or people with other talents from organizations to be mentors to our entrepreneurs. And we invite you to join us and be a mentor to our entrepreneurs. Join us, become a corporate partner, or you can purchase the work of our artists. You can go onto the website now. Uh, you have the cards in front of you, or you want to purchase any of the other items that our uh, people are making. Please go ahead, make that purchase. It's the way you can sustain us. And or you can join, become a community partner. Every quarter we hold business leadership meetings uh, with our corporate partners for Estata Corporation at their premises learning and innovation center. We hold industry doubt table conferences. We have held a lot of banker round table conferences. We hold statewide uh, financial education conferences. Uh, we have held self-employment seminars. So any of these organizations, uh, 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 events you can join us or sponsor us. Uh, we have working with a lot of, uh, these are some of our partners. Uh, we have held inclusive art shows at the Atlanta Art Galleries. Uh, we are in conversations with them to hold a, a physical location, an incubator space 
which is all inclusive and not just for people with disabilities. And finally, be like a shrimp. <laughs> And I mean it, you know, that this little shrimp, I didn't know this till recently, that this shrimp, that which is one centimeter long, churns the water, churns the oceans. And that churning of the ocean is very important because all the carbon dioxide that we give out, that churning of oceans generates oxygen for our planet. And that this little shrimp makes that churning possible. It moves up to the light, kicks the water back, one after the other, one after the other. So I request that be like that little shrimp Make that difference today, help our entrepreneurs, and be there to churn the tide against uh, for us. Thank you. Thank you, Ardy. Thank you so much. My name is Zach Bradley. Um, I work here as a vocational specialist and also a peer supporter. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you guys most about is what um, Debbie and I do uh, for vocational services here at Shepherd. So what do we do? So with our patients, um, after a catastrophic injury or illness, uh, we basically help them lead an active life, um, either returning to school or returning to work. Um, the biggest thing is we believe that the earlier, the earlier we talk about vocational, um, the more likely they are to engage. Um, so for most of our patients, that's as early as inpatient. So who do we work with? Um, any patient who's been at Shepherd Center. Um, that's either for a spinal cord injury, if they have multiple sclerosis, or any other neuromuscular disease. Um, and also we service our um, brain injury patients as well. Um, the difference with our brain injury patients is there's a vocational specialist at Shepherd Pathways that works with them. Um, but Debbie and I work with everyone else. So some of the services we provide um, are listed here. Uh, vocational assessment, um, I saved the slide just for that because I think that's the bulk of the work that we do. Um, so I'll touch on that um, a little bit more um, in the next slide. But Another thing is that we do is make a referral to state voc rehab. So we believe that state voc rehab um, is more often than not a new resource for all of our patients just because they don't have any pre-existing, well most of them don't have pre-existing um, disabilities, so this is very new for them. Um, and we believe that we refer them to voc rehab and we educate them about voc rehab because voc rehab is going to be able to help them further along the line than we can at um, Shepherd. Um, so for every patient that I meet, um, I try my best to find the VR that's closest to their home, develop a flyer. So the first time I meet them, I'm handing them a flyer and say, hey, we're going to have a conversation about work. But once you go home, you definitely need to give these people a call so that they can help you further. Um, career exploration. Oftentimes after a spinal cord injury um, or MS diagnosis, people can't return to the job that they did before. So with career exploration, we talk about work and talk about their skills. We talk about their interests. Um, and sometimes that, even, that is even followed up with some inventories and we don't do some preliminary work prior to people actually even going to VR or we engage them and we talk about um, some career options. Uh, resume development and job search skills, um, it's mostly for our outpatients um, and those are pretty much self-explanatory. Um, and then we talk about job site evaluations. Um, this is pretty fun for me. I had an opportunity to do this once. Or we went out to a, a person's job um, and we collaborated with their employer and we looked at um, all of the different um, um, accommodations that needed to be in place to set this person up to be successful. So this person was dealing with some cognitive things and some vision things, so we're like, okay, well these lights are a little too bright. Let's bring down these fluorescent lights. Um, let's get this person a private office. Is there room for a private office? Um, so between me, Debbie, and the um, employer, we worked together and collaborated to make this person um, job sites so accommodating and set them up to be most successful for their job. Um, and then we talk about volunteer experience. For some of my patients, maybe work isn't something that they want to do, but we also believe that one of the greatest things to recovery or one of the pieces to recovery is community re reintegration. So if we can't get you to work, um, let's talk about volunteering. Uh, what are some things that you're interested in? What are some things in your community that you can do to be successful? Um, just kind of keep you active and keep you busy so that you don't be deconditioned. Next one. All right, so vocational assessment. Um, I'm going to give Debbie um, the coin for this. She says we meet people where they are. Um, and I love that phrase because basically we're just going in and we're assessing what are the people, what are the person's resource, resources? Are they even interested in going to work? Are they already set up to go to work? Um, are they a work comp client? If they're a work comp client, 
Uh, we do a little with them, uh, but most often than not, they have external case managers that manages their care. Um, but sometimes we are called in to do, an ass to do assessments and assist. Um, but for our non-work uh, clients, um, one of our biggest things is assisting people with returning to work, especially if they have the same occupation or they have the same employer, or if they have the same employer, different occupation. What are those essential job functions? What do you need to be successful? So we help them negotiate accommodations, talk about accommodations. Half of the time, people don't even know what their essential job functions are. Um, so we have to say, okay, let's request that from your employer, um, and let's talk about what needs to happen to make you successful. Oftentimes, with our inpatients, they're already working with our assistive technology, so they're already thinking about navigating computer, um, navigating their office, navigating doors. Um, so all we have to do is basically talk and collaborate with the employer. Um, so we assist with the return to work plan. More often than not, um, actually almost always, we do a gradual return to work. Just because after a catastrophic injury or illness, I'm going back to work 40 hours a week right after injury is, is, is not feasible. So we talk with the employer, we talk with um, the patient, we look at their disability benefits, and we talk about, okay, let's do a gradual return to work. Let's maybe go to work half, two half days a week for right now. And as you continue to get endurance physically and mentally, we increase you and get you back to 40 hours a week so that you can sustain, sustain full-time employment. Um, and then again, we encourage everybody to get on the BR caseload uh, because they have things that we cannot do. So they have rehab technicians, especially for our individuals who do not live in the Atlanta area. It's like get on the BR caseload because they have a, um, a rehab technician that can go out and do those job site assessments that we can't quite do here in Atlanta. Um, and then also, um, they're a funding source for assistive technology. They can have individuals with driving evaluations, driving modifications. Um, and then they also are there to offer ongoing counseling and support. Um, VR sees people throughout the longevity of work and actually follow them even up to about 90 days after they're already employed. Um, so if you're in need of finding a different occup occupation, um, so we talk about that career exploration um, and also again, encouraging people to get on the VR caseload. Voc vocational evaluations, vocational training, um, and assistance with higher education and also job placement. So um, when we talk about financial inclusion, um, again, I think I'm a, a plug for VR. I talk about them a lot. Uh, but VR and their comparable benefits um, and how, um, depending on the individual's needs, um, there are comparable benefits. Um, and also, depending on a person's on Social Security, some of these services from Voc Rehab are free. Um, so definitely making sure that they talk with Voc Rehab and seeing what options and what resources are available. Um, and then we talk about disability management. So after a catastrophic injury or illness, um, short-term, long-term disability, all that stuff is so overwhelming. Um, and some of that terminology that they use um, isn't um, digestible from a lay person. So both Debbie and I, we go through this mail and we look at this mail and we help people understand what their benefits are. Um, what are your return to work um, incentives? How long does your evaluation periods um, last? So we're going through and helping people navigate this and counseling them counseling them through um, this pretty much traumatic and terrible experience. Um, and then we talk about with Social Security, we always um, encourage our people to get involved with their WIPAs, so their work incentive um, and planning and assistance programs. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about them on the next slide. Next slide. Perfect. Um, so what did the WIPAs do? So that's the work incentive is a planning and assistance program. Um, and they inform clients um, about working and earning an income and how the benefits will be affected. Um, and they provide accurate and individualized um, information. Um, and due to cooperative agreements with Social Security, um, these services are free. Um, and in Georgia, we have two. We have the benefits navigators and then we have the work incentives navigators. Um, and these two programs are uh, separated geographically. I had a map, but the map wasn't as pretty as I would have liked it to be to put it on the PowerPoint. Um, however, uh, we do have some WIPA representatives, um, Demetria and Marnice. They're currently raising their hands. And if you have any questions um, and you need more information about WIPAs and the services that they provide, they have already agreed that they're here to answer some questions if you have more. Um, and guys, that pretty much wraps us up. You can go to the next slide. So again, I said we service anybody who's been a shepherd patient. That's either current, past, um, 
And if they have the diagnosis of spinal cord injury, MS, or any other neuromuscular disease, please have them contact either Debbie or myself. Uh, we'll make sure that they get the services that they uh, need. And if they have a brain injury, they will want to uh, reach out to uh, Shelby um, at uh, Shepherd Pathways. But that's all she wrote, guys. And hope you guys learned something about what we do at, here at Shepherd Invoke Services. So our next speaker is Barry Wally, director of the Southeast ADA Center. Hi, everybody. I'm Barry Whaley. I'm the director of the Southeast ADA Center. We are based in Atlanta. We are here to promote voluntary compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act. We provide research. Um, we provide information. We provide print material. To let you know, we are a project of the Burton Blatt Institute at Syracuse University. Um, oftentimes, people say, why is Syracuse University in the Southeast? Uh, the Burton Blatt Institute is um, uh, an organization at Syracuse that looks for the civic, economic, and social participation of people with disabilities. So this is the perfect place for the Burton Blatt Institute and for Syracuse University to be. We have um, the highest concentration of people with disabilities in the country, in the southeast region. Um, we have a lot of people who are living in poverty, and we know that there is a, a correlation between poverty and disability and disability and poverty. So that's why we're here, and that's why it's important for us to be here. Um, we are part of the ADA National Network. Uh, we are one of 10 centers uh, that provide information and guidance on the Americans with Disabilities Act. <clears throat> and this is the area that we serve. We serve an area from Kentucky to Florida and from Mississippi to the Carolinas. So based in Atlanta, however, we uh, have affiliate networks in each of the states in our region uh, that, that help us to um, provide information and guidance. So what do we do? We answer questions about the ADA. Perhaps your rights have been violated. Maybe you're not sure that your rights have been violated. We can provide. Um, uh, impartial guidance. We do not provide legal opinions, but we can provide some information for you whether your rights have been violated perhaps under the ADA or perhaps an associated law. Um, so our, our staff is, is uh, very competent in, in all different areas. Um, we, and we do that via a technical assistance program. So if nothing else today, if you can remember 1-800-949-4232, that's a number you can call to talk to one of our technical assistance people uh, about a particular situation. Uh, we, we have a lot of relationship with, relationships with people throughout the Southeast. We have uh, relationships with architects. We have relationships with employers, uh, as well as people with disabilities. We also provide training. Uh, Pam, who is on my staff, and I, we, we do a lot of training throughout the Southeast on various aspects of ADA. Uh, in any given month, we are in anywhere from Florida to, to Kentucky to the Carolinas, and that's very important to get the word, about, word out about various uh, information about the law. We also develop publications. Those are both electronic publications as well as print on various aspects of the law. And then what I want to talk to you about today is our research. Uh, we are in a five-year research project uh, where we are looking at financial accessibility throughout the, the Southeast. Uh, and this is a three-part study. The first is, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the challenge. Now, I've talked to you a little bit about this already. We know that people, uh, and Michael had mentioned earlier, uh, are twice as likely to have disabilities and, and are far more likely to be unbanked or underbanked uh, using predatory lenders, payday loans, pawn shops. <clears throat> Most importantly, uh, throughout the Southeast, we have three states where people are chronically unbanked or underbanked, uh, Mississippi being number one on the list, not something we're very proud of. Uh, Georgia's third and Kentucky, where actually I live, is uh, the fifth most unbanked state in the country. So that's why we feel that it's very important for us to conduct our research here especially. So the first is a qualitative study. 
uh, or I'm sorry, a quantitative study where we are looking at um, financial inclusion. We have developed a tool which is called the FIT Kifi. We have been developing this for the, for the past year. FIT is our financial inclusion tool. Uh, where we are looking at various aspects of financial accessibility. And here's what we're looking at. We're looking at the strategy and the internal leadership of banks and credit unions. Uh, the accessibility of their customer support and their communications with people who have disabilities. Uh, physical accessibility. Um, I talked to a lady just last week uh, in Kentucky who tried to get into her bank and it's not accessible to her. So she found a way around to the bank, the, the back of the bank, where she was told this is the accessible entrance. However, when she got there and she rang the bell, no one came. Why? The bell was broken. It had been broken for about five years. And nobody had bothered to replace it. They said, well, nobody ever uses the back door, right? So we also look at both traditional services as well as online services. You know, the way people bank today is not the way I banked 10 years ago, you know? Uh, and I have a disagreement with people on my staff. I like to go into the bank. I like to talk to my banker, right? I like to know who they are. Other people use their smartphone at this point. So we're looking at all aspects of banking, both physical and virtual. Probably one of the most interesting things in using the Fit Kifi tool is that we are not, we, we are relying on what are called PAR researchers. PAR is participatory action research, where we are developing research teams in each of the eight states that will be composed of someone who is, has a physical disability, someone who is deaf or hard of hearing, someone who is blind or has low vision, uh, somebody with an intellectual disability or autism. Uh, than uh, someone who does not identify as having a disability. So those are the folks that we are going to have do this research for us. The second study then is a subjective study, and this is our qualitative study. What are the experiences of people with disabilities in using banking institution? What works for them? What, what are the barriers that you've encountered? What doesn't work for you? And hopefully we get a clearer understanding of why people choose predatory lenders or payday loan or, or some other alternative to traditional banking services. Then finally, we're going to engage in a contextual study. We know that much like there are food deserts, there are banking deserts. Um, I've spent most of my adult life in, in Louisville. And we know that people in the west end of Louisville, which generally has high concentrations of both poverty and disability have to go long distances in order to find a banking institution. Um, not only that, once they get there, what is the proximity of those banking institutions to uh, public transportation lines? So we want to look at this contextual study of where are institutions, banking institutions located, um, and how easy are they to get to, and are they on accessible paths of travel? Oops, there we go. So that's all I have as far as our financial research, and I think we're going to open it up for questions. Kate? All right, well, look at that. The questions are right there for those of you that want to read. I'm going to skip to question two. If fan financial institutions uh, and state or federal agencies could do more to promote the financial capability of people with disabilities, what would you recommend that they do? When you're promoting <laughs> people with disabilities, I think. Um, one of the ways of doing it is, you know, if you're trying to get somebody in the door with a disability, one, make sure they can get in the door, and then two, <laughs> make sure that you have um, formats um, available to, to the individual. I've gone to um, a couple of different banks and, you know, I've been, I've been handed a brochure with some very small font on it and when I ask, oh, you know, is there an electronic version of this or do you have a large print version, it's as if I sprouted a second head. So that's not a very welcoming um, thing <laughs> to do. And what happened is I walked right out of that institution and went to a different one <laughs> that would give me what I needed. So um, I think just creating that welcoming um, atmosphere from the beginning, from the moment you walk in the door, again, if you can get in the door, um, is important. And that's, that's what's going to draw people to you. Thank you. I think education is the key to it. Uh, 
if you have to care for and for the banks, education for the bank financial institutions, that this is a large population that they need to reach out to. And with new products like ABLE Act coming into the biz, uh, into uh, uh, pre prevalent now, it makes economic sense for financial organizations to talk to uh, people with disabilities. So I think that's what's important. And for folks with disabilities to get into the banking system, they also need to see, understand why it is and what are, how we can, uh, it is helping them. So for instance, the new initiative in Atlanta, the Bank on Atlanta, which is uh, coming together of financial organizations and especially providing banking services to low and uh, low income groups and making sure that people with disabilities are part of that conversation is an important tool that can be taken in. So it has, I think, education both ends is required. Thank you. Well, I think the two things that, that, that banks could do is, is to be flexible and, and recognize value in, in customers who have disabilities. Um, you know, we have created a, a service system that is based upon keeping people who have disabilities impoverished. We've started to address that, you know, in terms of ABLE accounts and, 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 and other mechanisms, but banks generally don't value people with disabilities as customers. So I think that, that changing that, that discussion to the value that people with disabilities bring to the table, recognize that there are opportunities for wealth building. And, and on the flexibility side, understanding that, yeah, we've created a, a, a system where people are kept in poverty, so, so a credit score alone is, is not always a measure of being a good risk. Uh, and, and I think that's important for banks and, and credit unions. Um, and I think um, with me being a consumer and definitely being an individual of the disability co community, I think since like the ABLE Act, like, there should be more incentives. Um, there should be more incentives to get individuals um, with disabilities to invest or um, giving them more opportunities to save um, and kind of giving them more flexibility to what to do with those savings. Uh, because when we talk about the ABLE Act, it's um, geared towards more sort of disability expense. Um, but what about if I wanted to save to just go on a vacation or if I wanted to save to, to just do something wild with my money? I don't know what that may be. But um, I think there should just be more flexibility with some of these savings accounts and um, some of these incentives that are being offered. And, and Zach, if you don't mind, could you talk a little bit about your journey uh, post-injury to now full-time employment? Um, yeah, sure. So I got injured at age 19. Um, and when I got injured, I was um, awarded like SSI and Medicaid. And for a very long time, I, mean, I didn't understand what that meant. Um, I just knew that I was collecting the check and it felt great. Um, and I bought a ton of pair of shoes. It was awesome. Um, <laughs> but at the time I was in college and I was thinking about what am I going to do with my career? And once I started to start working in uh, Social Security because I did not understand my benefits and I did not go out and seek the necessary resources, um, I started working and Social Security came for me and said, okay, why didn't you tell me you made this few hundred dollars? I need my money back. Um, so that happened to me a, a few times, right? And then now as a working employee, and I am, I, now that I understand the system a lot better, I mean, I've sought out the right resources. I think that I am upset with the system. I, I remember I went to a seminar and they said that the system is oppressing. And I totally agree with it because now working as an adult, I make a certain amount of money and now I have to approve, oh, I have to approve um, impairment work-related expenses so that I can be at a cap or be at a, a lower amount of money just so I can continue to get my services. Does that make sense? So with a person like myself who was on Medicaid, I needed a caregiver to get to work. I needed a caregiver to get to school. I wasn't independent enough to be able to, to do those things. But then once I started to make money, they're like, okay, well, you're making too much money. I need to get the money back or you can't have Medicaid anymore. So I think the system is definitely very oppressing. Um, and for my personal goals, it's all right, well, I want to beat the system. I have the capability to be more independent. So I'm gonna be independent 
say, I don't need Medicaid anymore, but that's my own personal experience. There's other people, and I have colleagues who say, I need a caregiver, I need a caregiver day and night. I can't be successful without one. What do those people do? And over Thank what you. period of time was that? In regards to? Since your injury to now. Uh, it's been seven years, um, but I went, I was in um, undergrad and I went and got a master's degree, so I've taken the time to, to get degrees and um, kind of capitalize on that regard. So if I couldn't work and make money, I was like, I might as well go to school and, <laughs> and continue buying shoes. <laughs> well, and my question to Danny, maybe it's for the panel kind of in general, is, you know, it, it's, if you never heard this panel before, I tend to think you tend to get this idea that there's all these wonderful resources out there for the disability community, and, and yet the reality is it's, it's, it, there's not a lot of capacity. I mean, Danny, would you talk about just a little bit, and maybe I missed it because I jumped out when the sound blew in my ear. Um, maybe I didn't talk about it, but talk about how much money you're actually loaning, how many people are actually benefiting your program, because maybe that'll give us an idea better of what your real scale is what, what versus what it needs to be. Yeah, so, um, uh, so a little bit about the, the capacity <laughs> of my program. So since um, in the last year, about year and a half, uh, we've provided 75 loans to people throughout the state. Um, we've loaned a little over $200,000 um, in that program, and those have been you know, a wide variety <laughs> of needs um, from the credit builder programs, people tend to, to go for that, the upper limit, <laughs> the maximum of $1,000. Um, when it, you're looking at the AT loans, people have done them for, you know, a copay for a communication device, for a power chair. They've done it for a home modification. Um, and that's been, again, a wide range. Um, our average loan for the AT program is less than $5,000. But um, keep in mind, you know, we did 75 loans. Uh, currently, we have about 150 to 175 active loans. Um, but that's nothing <laughs> compared to the people in Georgia that need the program. Um, one of the barriers that people face, uh, one of the reasons they come to me is because they have not been able to get a loan um, at a bank or a credit union. Um, and that's because of high debt to income ratios. Um, it's because of limited income. Uh, probably 95% of our consumers, um, their only income is SSI or SSDI. We're working with one person who has income of $500 a month. Um, so as you can imagine, I, I, I um, was at a conference back in March, uh, the CRA conference down in Miami, and I was at a table full of bankers and talking about, oh yeah, well, you know, I've worked with people whose debt to income ratio is as high as 87% and they fell out of their chairs <laughs> because that, that apparently was too risky <laughs> of an investment for most people. Um, when you look at uh, credit scores, again, if you acquire a disability, things go sideways for a bit and your credit score takes an impact. Um, when you're working with low income, high in debt to income ratio, uh, maybe not working, plus those factors that impact your credit score, a lot of people aren't willing to, um, to take that risk. And I will tell you, um, our, our default rate um, for my program is less than 3% right now. Um, because once, you've, once you work with a person, once they get the equipment they need to be independent, they're going to pay that money back. Um, also, I guilt them uh, by telling them, I'm like, look, if you skip out on me, then you're preventing other people <laughs> from using this program. We were here for you. We want to be there for other people that need it as well. Um, but we have seen, you know, I have seen working with, um, um, and I can give a specific shout out to Regions, <laughs> working with them, looking at some of the initiatives that they have for accessibility and for inclusion. Um, I'm seeing some good stuff that's coming down the line, but we're still needed, um, you know, as a resource for the, the disability community. Um, and I work really hard <laughs> for that outreach part and to get people to, to know about it and to get involved. So um, hopefully that answered. Yeah. Oh, sorry, <laughs> Mark. Thank you. All right, I think we should do a lightning round before we close up. So just very quickly, uh, if you could do one thing to improve 
the financial stability and informed decision making of people with disabilities, what would that be? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to go first. You can pass I, it. I'm going to pass want. it down. And and we can go back. I'll come back. <laughs> I think I'll open up, there'll be no segregated, special, anything. That would be me. I don't want a special career path. I don't want a special education, special classes, nothing special, because the world is not special for any adult. It's the same platform. Okay, Kate, give me the question one more time. <coughs> the question is, if you could do one thing to improve financial stability and inform decision making, by people with disabilities, what would that be? Well, I think being here is a good start. I think, I think spreading the news, making people more aware of products and services that would be available, um, alternative lending, um, you know, I think all those things. I think we, we have a gospel to spread and we, we need to, to make sure that that people understand what mechanisms might be available to them uh, because people are very uninformed. Thank you. Um, if there was one thing that I could do, it would um, definitely like widen out the range for um, flexibility to make income. Uh -huh. um, I think that number is too low, mm -hmm. um, I think, and that's what keeps people in poverty. I mean, if we can spread that number out and widen that number out and make individuals with disabilities more likely to make the income of our non-disabled peers, I think that that's one thing I would love to do. Uh -huh. here, here. Do you want to add one, Dan? Okay. This is where I can be like, I would like to reiterate everything that my colleagues have said. <laughs> um, no, but... Uh, <laughs> that's why I went last now. Um, no, I think one thing would be to, um, to increase that financial stability decision-making. Um, getting financial institutions to, to look at the model that we use for Credit Able. Uh, shameless plug um, to look at, you know, making sure that, you know, I, I run an alternative financing program. I love my program. Um, but if people had more options to go to, that would be fantastic. And I would love for them to be able to go to, you know, Credit Able X or Bank Y to, um, to get the services that I'm providing. Uh, so there we go. <laughs> Thank you. I will thank you to our panelists.